214, actually. The slapdash over 200 was for dramatic purposes only. Of course I keep count. Generalization is for idiots. For people like you. Oh, don't be so taken aback. Me? An idiot? How can you say such thing to a perfect stranger? Usually, on the internet, one needs to at least express an opinion before being labeled as such. No? Not in this case. I don't require any knowledge of your person to know you're an idiot. All that matters is that you're not me. Perhaps there's a fraction of a chance that I'm wrong, but it's highly unlikely. In all the time I've been alive, I've met hundreds of people, and every single one of them has been stupid as sin. By the age of five, I was well aware that my parents, my teachers, everyone trying to teach me about life on Earth was light years beneath me in terms of intellect. I was smart enough to pretend to be normal, to slip below the radar while I got my bearings in the strange existence. But I always knew. But the killings, what about the killings? How do I pull them off? Raw intelligence, that's how. It's tricky to describe to a basic mind. Essentially, I learned in my younger years that I could make people act however I want by sheer force of will. Unthinking obedience. Wordless submission to a superior mind. Is this making any sense to you? Okay, here's a common example. I can walk into a hotel, any hotel I choose, and the woman behind the counter will hand me the keys to the penthouse suite, without comment. Nice, isn't it? And if I fancy the look of this woman, she'll follow me up to the room, will do whatever I want for an hour or so. Then she'll get redressed, fix her hair, and return to her station, never to think about the encounter again. The best part is that it all happens without either of us speaking a single word. I find conversations so tiring, don't you? So yes, it's a nice life I lead, though it does get dull sometimes. So I liven it up by killing people. Alright, if you're being pedantic, I've never physically murdered anyone, but I don't need to. Suppose I'm cruising around in a nice sports car I've procured and some specimen in a Range Rover neglects to indicate at a crucial moment inconveniencing myself and the other drivers. It takes a matter of seconds for me to think, do us all a favor and drive into a wall. And then they will. I've rid the world of numerous poor drivers that way, though it does play havoc with the traffic. Not visceral enough for you, hmm? Well, how about this? I was catching a train the other day when a well-dressed man of about 30 or so, jabbering some business jargon into his phone, walked into me as I stood on the platform. Naturally, I expected an apology but instead he sneered at me and said, Watch it, buddy, before striding off. And me, standing still. Unbelievable. So to the back of his head I thought, Over the edge now, off you trot. And, still engaged in the call, he strode out of the waiting crowd and into an oncoming train. He actually hit it mid-stride, spraying young mother nearby with a little of his brains. As I watched her scream, I thought, Dear... Do you really need to make such a fuss? It was hardly being put to good use to begin with. No matter. I was able to slip away and catch another train before the chaos really started. I never watched the evening news, but I did tune in that night to see how the event was interpreted by our eminent authorities. It was, apparently, evidence of our increasing over-reliance on personal gadgetry. We are seeing a systematic loss of social awareness, said a serious looking woman in red lipstick. You see what I mean? Stupidity on an endemic level. It appalls me sometimes. There are moments when I feel it would be nice to have someone of equal intelligence around, just so I could have an enlightened conversation. But then, how could I live life the way I do without a planet full of idiots? Sleeping wherever I want, eating whatever I want, fucking whoever I want and, of course, killing whenever I want, and not a single person bright enough to notice. Well, that isn't completely true. There was one person once who may have suspected. It was my own fault. I killed two people in the space of a month, neither of them strangers, neither of them a quiet, easy death. Sloppy work, I know. Even at twelve, I ought to have known better. But they were so dreadful. One was my math teacher, Mr. Crompton. 
Though I limited my academic output to avoid attracting attention, somewhere in his tiny mind he could sense how vast my intelligence was in comparison to his, and it infuriated him. He'd sprinkle his lessons with little remarks to try and goad the children into laughing at me. I hope this isn't too boring for you, or please could you at least try to look interested. I'd seen him behave similarly towards other children he disliked, but I wasn't obliged to put up with such treatment. As for the other, that was a student. Her name was Sam. To put it briefly, she confessed her love for me, kissed me passionately, then revealed the whole thing had been done on a dare. The story circulated, and I was much mocked by the other students, particularly Sam's friends. My rage was less at being laughed at, I didn't care for their opinions, but more at being outwitted. I ought to have read Sam's intentions, to not have been such a boy. It was beneath me. So in a state of high emotions, I took messy revenge on them both. Sam was first. She used to ride a bicycle to school, often arriving at the last minute. That was to my advantage. So too was a line of ornate spikes across the top of the school gate. I took my opportunity one morning when I and the other students were assembled outside, waiting for the first bell. Sam came hurtling up the road towards us, late as usual. From the edge of the yard, hidden among the children, it was easy to direct her to not slow down on approach, but rather break the front wheel hard at precisely the wrong moment. Her body was flung in an arc over the handlebars, hitting the gate head first. The spikes entered beneath her chin and exited somewhere around the bridge of her nose. The best part was that all her little friends were assembled by the gate, waiting for her to arrive. Their faces were priceless. I really ought to have had a camera. Mr. Crompton's end came shortly after. He used to spend his lunchtime smoking behind the boys' changing rooms. He was even easier than Sam. All I had to do was make him drop his hand a matter of inches so the lighter caught his shirt rather than the tip of his cigarette. Then I forced him to stand still for some time while the flame built, until there was so little left of him I knew I could let him run around and scream blue murder without any chance of recovery. And that's just how it went. He ran out onto a field of children, flesh bubbling and charred, waving what remained of his arms around and screaming his tattered lungs hoarse before collapsing in a smoking heap. Here's a top tip, don't burn people to death in your own place of work or study. Satisfying though it might have been, those changing rooms stank for weeks, but that was the least of my worries. I hadn't been sufficiently careful. The deaths were too close together. Someone was bound to get lucky and guess at the truth. And someone did. She was a friend of Sam's, see, and she also shared my class with Mr. Crompton. She knew the connection. Not long after he died, she started casting long, sideways glances at me. Brief ones at first, but they grew longer, like she was daring me to meet her gaze. I pretended not to notice. At last, it became too much for her. She slammed, supposedly as an accident, but obviously on purpose, straight into me in the middle of the corridor. My things scattered everywhere. I stared up at her, finally meeting her eye. You, she said to me. She was struggling for words. Calmly I watched, playing the victim for any observers. You little... You little freak! She streaked it in my face, then stormed away in angry, confused tears. That was all she could muster. School ended soon after, and her family moved away over the summer, taking her and her suspicions with them. That was as close as anyone has ever come to figuring me out. I actually tracked her down a few years ago. She was married, working as a nurse in a local hospital. As I watched her go about her day, I considered killing her. Nurses are always overworked, accidents happen, etc, etc. She had called me a freak, practically attacked me. I've killed people for far less. But it seemed, I don't know, ignoble to treat a former adversary like that. So I killed her husband instead. Sleep walked right out the window, what a bother. But it was a little strange. I was parked across the street to watch the action, and I remember how she came to the window afterwards, looking down at his body lying mangled across the driveway. There was a look on her face, not distraught or shocked. She looked deep in thought. It gave me the queerest feeling. I got the impression that, despite everything, somehow she knew it was me. But that was years ago. Now the only people I kill are strangers, me to them and them to me. 
We're still strangers, aren't we? You'll notice I've kept this impersonal. No age, no country, no name. You might try and assemble an image based on my language and past, but remember, these things are easily disguised. Who am I? Everyone. No one. What do I look like? Boring. Unmemorable. What do I want? Little civilization, that's all. I've learned to live among imbeciles. All I want is to do so in peace. So use your head, please. Obey the signs. Be polite, be respectful, watch your step. Because if you don't, well, perhaps it will be fine. Perhaps you'll get away with a glare and a tut. Or perhaps a stranger, one forgettable face in the crowd, will follow you home and stand outside your window, waiting in the dark for you to enter the bathroom and watch without blinking as you fix your eyes on the mirror and slice your neck open from ear to ear, blood streaming onto white ceramic, not knowing why, not knowing how, knowing only the pain as your last spark of consciousness drains away. That's a possibility too.